we know from the Gospels, when the Lord Jesus was 30 years of age, he began his public ministry on the earth. And it records in the Gospels how the Lord was baptized. And he came up from the water, and it tells us that the heavens were opened. The spirit as a dove descended upon the Lord, and a voice out of heaven, you are my son, the beloved, in you I have found my delight. And then it tells us in the Gospels how the Lord was immediately thrust into the wilderness. And he was undergoing a very severe trial for 40 days by the devil, Satan. And among those temptations, one of them, the devil would bring the Lord up to a very high mountain. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said, if you will only bow down and worship me, all this is yours. And we know what the Lord said. He said, go away, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Uh, the reason why I begin in this way, dear brothers and sisters, is because tonight, as we begin to share about this topic, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, actually we're making a transition in the book of 1 Corinthians. So far, all the problems we've been dealing with are in the human realm, such as divisions, the problem of marriage, lawsuits among believers, the matter of eating, their problems in the human realm. But now when we come to chapters 10 and especially 11, we're making a turn. The problems are now focused on something related to God's administration and God's kingdom in this universe. And so this matter of the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, we have to realize is a matter of our worship of God. And throughout the centuries, ever since man was created, there has been an intense struggle, an intense battle over this matter of the genuine worship of God. You see in Matthew 4, that account I mentioned, yeah, God is seeking worship. But the devil, you see, is also seeking worship. And so some of you may be familiar with this passage in John chapter 4. The Lord was at the well, and there was a Samaritan woman, and she had a religious concept of what it meant to worship God. She thought to worship God, you have to be in the mountain or in the temple. But then the Lord said, the hour is coming and it is now when the true worshipers of God will worship the Father in spirit and in truthfulness. The Father seeks such to worship him. And so tonight when we're covering the matter of the Lord's table and the Lord's supper, we're covering a very crucial matter in God's heart because God is after true worship. Now, I just have to ask you all tonight a little question. When you think of God, what do you think of? Who is God to you? Is God your savior? Is God your redeemer? Is God your life? Okay, well, tonight we have to see something further that god is god yeah god is god the god of the universe and he desires worship you realize there's something in this matter that is not for the believer's satisfaction but it's for god's satisfaction so as we go through the outline i don't have any slides today it's just the handout you will see the first roman numeral would emphasize the believer's satisfaction, our enjoyment at the Lord's table and the Lord's supper. 
Some believers may know this as communion. But then when we come to Roman numeral 2, you will see the Lord's Supper in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians emphasizes the Lord's satisfaction. Our God wants to be satisfied with true worshipers. Okay. So I hope tonight as we come to this uh, topic, I would implore us all to leave behind all your concepts and all your traditions, even growing up as a believer, of what you think worship is. And we will come back to the pure word of God to see what the word of God tells us about worship. Okay, can we do that? Right now we just make a turn, we drop our concepts, and we come back to the word of God. Okay, so let's come to the outline. So Roman numeral one, the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians 10 emphasizes the believer's fellowship of the Lord's blood and of his body for the believer's satisfaction. And so in 1 Corinthians 10, it says we have the fellowship of the body of Christ through the bread on the table. You see the physical bread on the table at the Lord's Supper. And then 1 Corinthians 10 tells us we have the fellowship of the blood of Christ. That's the cup. It's grape juice or it could be wine. That's also on the table for the believer's satisfaction. Okay, so I mentioned tonight we have to drop our concepts, right, of what worship is. Well, you know, every time in the Bible when worship is mentioned, did you realize eating and drinking are there? Isn't that interesting? You know, often, and I'm not saying it's wrong, but some people may think of worship as getting on your knees, prostrating yourselves before God. Maybe they think it's doing something like this with your hands. But actually, I'll tell you, the true worship is eating and drinking God himself. In Roman number one, it tells us fellowship. That word fellowship in the original language means a kind of joint participation, an enjoyment. You see, when you know that common phrase, you are what you eat. Well, eventually as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we become one with what we eat. We become one with the Lord Jesus. And so in the whole Bible, whenever worship is mentioned, you see eating and drinking are there. In Exodus, when God called Moses to deliver his people out of Egypt, through Moses, he told Pharaoh, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. It was a feast. That is what was on God's heart for his people to worship him. And then eventually when they left Egypt, you have the feast of the Passover, the feast of the unleavened bread. And by the time they got to Mount Sinai, when God gave his people the Ten Commandments, you know that? In Exodus 24, it tells us that God's people, the elders, beheld God in heaven as they ate and drank. And eventually in Leviticus, it tells us that God would ordain his people to have seven feasts in a year. To keep the feast is to worship God. So now we come to the New Testament, right? We're in the New Testament age. We have to realize in the New Testament, God has still required us to keep the feast. That's the Lord's table and the Lord's supper. Every week, it should serve as a reminder for the believer that we are not living on this earth for ourselves, but for God's satisfaction. And I will come back to that point in Roman numeral two. Okay, so now I'll go through the outline. I will not dwell on every point. I will just point out uh, different matters as we go through. How about we have 
Okay, so A is the significance of the bread. Can we have the brothers read one in the verse? Being of life, John 6, 35, Jesus said, Yeah, so the bread is of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You see, it, you know, I remember as a college student, when I went to the Lord's table, it's quite often on the Lord's day, I couldn't explain it, but after partaking of that bread and of that cup, inwardly there was a strengthening. There was a further seeking to pursue the Lord. And quite often that Lord's day in the afternoon, I would just spend more time in the word of God, more time in prayer. Why is that? It's because I ate of the living bread. And you know, when I was working, I'll tell you, Monday morning is the gloomiest time in the work environment because no one is looking forward to another week grinding at work. You know, it's just depressing. But there I was happy. <laughs> Have you ever seen a happy colleague on Monday? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it's because of that Lord's Day. When we're genuinely satisfied by the Lord as the bread of life, we're strengthened within. Our whole countenance is uplifted. Okay, so two. How, how about let's have the sisters read. Signifying the Lord's physical body. 1 Corinthians. So we have the physical body of Christ signified by that bread on the table. And then when we come to three, we have to realize that bread also signifies the Lord's mystical body. First Corinthians 10, 17 says, seeing that there's one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So the Lord, you know, through his death and his resurrection, he produced the church. When the Lord was on the earth, he was just one man, a single, vessel man yet god but eventually through his death it tells us in john chapter 12 as the grain of wheat he was sown into the earth but we know any seed sown would rise up right in resurrection in multiplication so that verse tells us if that unless that seed falls into the ground it abides alone but if it dies, it bears much fruit. So through the Lord's death and resurrection, he produced you. He produced me as the many believers, as the church. And we became the Lord's mystical body. And so I just have to tell you this. That bread on the table signifies the one body of Christ. There's one bread. There's one body. Maybe on the Lord's day in Berkeley, maybe there's only 50 brothers and sisters there upstairs, but we have to have the realization when we break that bread, when we partake of that bread, that includes all the believers throughout time and space. All those believers are included in that bread. And so I would just say this as an aside, it is not right for us Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us, and this was the issue Paul was addressing in the church in Corinth. Some were not discerning the body properly. They were going to the Lord's table in the improper way. And it tells us that actually some died physically in the church in Corinth because they did not discern the body when they took of the Lord's Supper. And so when we come to the Lord's Supper, we have to discern the body. What does that mean? It means when we come, we have to discern whether that bread on the table signifies the one body of Christ. See, if it's part of any divisive group, if it's part of any group that doesn't recognize the universal body of Christ, we cannot partake of it. Yeah, because Christ is not divided. His body is not divided. 
when we partake of that bread, we have to partake with the realization there is one bread in the universe. Okay, so I'll keep moving on. So in B, we have the significance of the cup being of blessing. How about let's have the brothers again read for us 1 Corinthians 10, 16a. The cup. So it's a cup of blessing. It's not outward blessing. It's not material blessing. Okay. How about the sisters can read Psalm 16, 5. Jehovah. Yeah, so do you realize the cup which we have received is God himself? God is our inheritance. God is our cup. He maintains our lot. You know, as fallen sinners, we were evil beyond hope. God, who is righteous and holy, our destiny was the lake of fire. Our destiny was eternal perdition. But through Christ, right, God sent his only begotten son, Christ, to die for us. And he shed his blood. In the Bible, it tells us he drank of the cup of wrath so that we would not have to taste the torment of eternal perdition. Christ drank that cup for us. He drank the cup of wrath so that we can have the cup of blessing. Now, God is our portion, like that song we sung, right? God is now our all and in all, our portion. And then two tells us, this cup is the new covenant. First Corinthians eleven twenty five shows us that. In the new covenant, we have all of God's promises, all of his blessings, the forgiveness of sins, the imparting of lo the Lord's divine life, our inward ability to know God, our being God's children, that is all contained in the new covenant. That is all contained in the cup that we drink. Okay, before I move on to Roman numeral two, I do have to let us know, we're gonna invite you all to the Lord's table, 9.45 a.m. on the Lord's day, okay? So don't be alarmed. It's a meeting we have every Lord's day to keep the feast. But I have to mention here two items that can frustrate our enjoyment at the Lord's table. The first one is undealt with offenses between us and another member. It's very good if we have, if we know of any problem between us and another brother or sister, for us to go to that brother or sister and apologize before the Lord's table. <clears throat> and then the second issue I have to mention is something the Apostle Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 10. He said, you cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the demon's table. And what the believers were doing in that time were eating sacrifices given to idols, food sacrifices. Now we don't have those kind of things in America, but in Ezekiel, it would tell us that God's people had set up idols in their heart. And so I have to ask you all, when you come to the Lord's table, what is foremost in your heart? You see, an idol is anything that replaces the Lord in our life. It's anything we love more than the Lord. And I'll tell you, this is my experience. Often when I come to the Lord's table, sometimes my condition was not proper, especially as a college student. There was something between me and the Lord, an idol, not physical but something in my heart. And that caused a separation between me and the Lord. And the Lord tells us, we can still seek him in an outward way, but we cannot find him because there's that idol. There's that 
separation between us and the Lord. And so we just have to take care of these two things as we come to the Lord's table. Dealing with any offenses between brother and sister and asking the Lord for his forgiveness and the cleansing from anything we partook of. America is a worldly country full of entertainment and pleasure. For us to really enjoy the Lord's feast, we have to deal with that. Okay, so that is a good transition to bring us to Roman numeral 2. So the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11 emphasizes the believer's remembrance of the Lord and the declaration of his death for his satisfaction. So now we come to this matter of God's satisfaction. Um, okay, I think I changed the outline. Let me see. In A, okay, yes. The real remembrance of the Lord is to eat the bread and to drink the cup. So as I mentioned earlier, true worship is eating and drinking the Lord. That is where God receives the true worship. And so when we talk about remembrance, the Lord said, eat the bread unto the remembrance of me. He said, drink the cup unto the remembrance of me. You see, remembrance is not a mere mental thinking. What's the Lord to me? What did the Lord do to, for me? That is still very superficial, I would say, just to think in our mind. You see, in John 4, the Lord told the Samaritan woman, true worship is in spirit. It's deeper. It's in truthfulness. And it requires us to eat and drink the cup. And so, you know, this is something I've been learning from more experienced brothers and sisters. Often at the table, an indication that the Lord was satisfied with our worship is when we are satisfied. You see, in John chapter 4, the Lord told the woman at the well, I have living water to give to you to drink. She drank and she was satisfied. But eventually, when the disciples came, they were in the city. The Lord was outside by the well. They came to him, brought him food. You know what the Lord said? He said, I have food you do not know of. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. And so who was satisfied that day? Was it the woman or was it the Lord Jesus? You see, it was both. When the woman drank, God ate. Yeah. So when we're satisfied at the Lord's Supper, God is satisfied. Okay, and then when we come to B, we conclude with this point. Although we're told to remember the Lord, we are not told to remember the Lord's death, but to declare it. You see, this is a change, I think, in many of our concepts. We think at the table, the first thing we have to do is remember how the Lord was crucified, how his hands were pierced, how he suffered the agony. Well, actually, according to the Bible, the first thing related to the Lord's death is not to remember. But the word declare means to proclaim and to announce. We must proclaim and announce the Lord's death to the entire universe, to God, to man, to the angels, and to the devil. I don't know how many of us realize this, but on the cross, Christ won the victory. Did you realize that? That cross was not just a cross where he dealt with our sin, where he shed his blood for our redemption. Hebrews 2.14 on your outline, it tells us that Christ through death destroyed him who has the might of death, the devil. You see on that cross, not only was Christ crucified, but all the, the devil and his cohorts, all the evil spirits, the demons, the fallen angels, they were all crucified with him. And then the next verse, Psalm 23, 5 tells us that God spreads a table before us in the presence of our adversaries. We need another view when we come to the Lord's Supper to realize actually present there is not just us, the believers, not just God, not just Christ, not just the Spirit. Actually, all of God's enemies 
his adversaries are there witnessing with us. And we are there boldly announcing, proclaiming as a report, Christ has won the victory. Christ has destroyed the devil. That is our declaration at the Lord's table. We declare his death. And then finally, okay, how about let's all read two together. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six indicates. Okay, so I end with this verse. Declare his death until I come. That's what the Lord said in Matthew 26. Right before he went to the cross, he told his disciples, do this until I come back. So you see, brothers and sisters, it's not an option to go to the Lord's table. Actually, among the meetings we have as a believer, this is the most important because the Lord charged us to do this until I come. And in Matthew 26, 29, he says, I will by no means drink of the product of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in the kingdom of my father. So you see every time we eat the bread and drink the cup, it's a reminder weekly that our life on this earth is not for our own satisfaction, but we are living here for God, for the Lord, for his return, for his kingdom. And so Acts 27, I just end with this, tells us on the first day of the week, we gather together to break bread. So scripturally, it tells us every week we come together on the Lord's day to keep the feast. What a life. How exciting is this? Every Lord's Day should serve as a reminder for us. Our life is not for ourselves, but we are here living for God's kingdom. We are here with the full anticipation, the eager expectation that our Lord will come back. And in that day in the kingdom, we will drink anew with him that cup. Amen. Wow. Aren't you encouraged? Amen. So I, anyways, I'll just pass it back to the MCs. This is on the Lord's heart, brothers and sisters. He wants us to keep the feast until he comes. Yeah, I hope we will all take this word to heart and obey. Don't make me happy. Don't make your brothers and sisters happy. This is to make the Lord happy. The Lord charged us to do this until I come. Amen. <laughs>